Good afternoon, everybody. Many thanks for rejoining us. It was a very nice lunch up there on the, on the terrace. It was kind of a wrench to come down. I'm really glad to see so much networking going on. So we're now going to move into our afternoon activities of two workshops. Um, the first one is Social Equity in Tech and Data Science. It's going to be led by Dr. Hen Wilkinson. Um, Hen first joined the JGI as an ESRC fellow and is now working with Refrain, which is a University of Bristol group, um, looking into online harms. And at the same time as doing all this, she's also a practitioner in, in conflict resolution. Um, um, is that, would that be a good description? You can, you can introduce yourself, Hen. Um, so um, seeing both sides of the coin from the academic perspective and also the practitioner perspective. So we're particularly, I'm particularly pleased to be able to welcome Hen to lead us in this workshop. Let's give her a round of applause. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for the applause. And, and thanks for being here on such a sunny afternoon as well. And I was just reflecting uh, before we started, it's really hard to know what people are going to talk about in the morning at an event like this or after you in an event like this. So you have no idea whether what you're bringing is on point or useful. But in fact, I, as I was listening to many of the presentations, the data face presentation, the panel presentation, Ernesto's presentation, a lot of them were touching on the same kinds of topics as I'm thinking about, albeit with different framings, maybe different language. So, I'm uh, part of this, but I'm the social science aspect of this. In fact, I'm possibly the only social scientist at the Gene Golding Institute, and I'm not a data scientist. So I'm sort of bringing a very different perspective, and I'm enjoying that because it's something about meeting in the middle of these minds, these different disciplines, which is really interesting. So that's me, obviously, and down here on my left is uh, Partha, who sadly is not here. He sends his fulsome apologies, but he was um, unable to attend, but he has sent us a short video, which I'm going to show you in a minute. But we're part of this group, the IPTG, the Interdisciplinary Peace Tech Group, which is looking at the intersection of peace building and technology. So it's got practitioners, it's got tech people, it's got thinkers, it's got doers, and it's got people from across the world. So on Monday, Tuesday, I think, I did a workshop online with Arik, who's in Israel, and he was also part of the group, and he was talking about his current work in Israel on the ground, working with the polarization, political polarization there talking about the influence of tech on that polarization, but also about how the tech can be used to counter it. So that's the sort of field that I'm in, but I'm not necessarily talking all about that. I'll come back to that a bit uh, at the end of the talk. So I may stop at some point and say, talk to your neighbors. I may not, we'll see how the time goes. At the end, definitely there'll be an opportunity to have some questions. And if I shout because of this microphone, let me know, somebody wave if it starts giving you feedback, headaches. Social equity, this is the definition I'm using for this event. Impartiality, fairness and justice for all. Well, I don't know when you look at it, when I look at it, my heart sinks. And the reason my heart sinks is because that is an impossibility, right? But it is an aspiration. And it's in the aspiration that I'm talking into today. Because unless we hold things like that as an aspiration ahead of us, we really lose sight of some of the things that drag us in that direction. So as I'm talking, just be aware that that's the sort of environment that I'm thinking about. And I'm looking about at how we can bring the two sides of a conversation around tech and the social into a common conversation, into decision-making processes that involve both sides of those things. And I'm sure immediately you can recognize that that was also a theme in some of the earlier talks that we've listened to. So I'm actually gonna draw on reflections from three different areas of thinking. One is the capabilities approach, and Path is going to talk about that. That is a framework of thought from Amartya Sen's work, and it's about assessing needs for individuals based on their actual context, not on a generalization. And he and other colleagues at Refrain, which is a cybersecurity center, it's looking at the National, it's the National Center for Prevention of Online Harms. They have been thinking about how can they adapt, adopt SEN's work for thinking about preventing um, privacy, for privacy enhancement basically online. 
I'm going to look at the design justice uh, network principles, which are emerging at MIT, which is thinking about very much the stuff that Joanne was talking about, that Ernesto was talking about, about how do we actually involve people in the creation of appropriate new tech in the way that we engage with data science. And so I'm actually going to unpick slightly some of those things that are underpinning that. Hope that that may be useful in some way. We can come back and discuss a bit later. And I'm going to finish the presentation with looking at the idea of peace tech, which is this intersection of uh, peace building and technology. But that can be peace building in post-violent conflicts. But it, it can also be, and in fact, a lot of the work that tech is involved in is around um, social cohesion, challenging toxic polarization. So I'm going to look a little bit at some of the things for that and how, what is low tech, but I'll hold that. That's an exciting thing we can come back to. So for me, this is where we've got to. We've got to the production of technology by society. That's where we started. And now we've got to the production of society. No, other way around. Production of technology by society. Now we've got to the production of society I just on the same thing again. Anyway, you can read it. You know what it says. And you get my point. And my point is, we've moved. Things have shifted. And there's a really important aspect to think about in that second part. And this, this guy writes about peace tech stuff. And he says, entanglements in software and hardware with social practices out of which agency emerges. So this idea that it's not just, you know, the, the hardware that we've got or the the programs that are being developed for it, but it's how do we as individuals with our own social practices, every one of us different, engage with that. And then out of that, agency emerges. Agency, the ability to act. But the question is, does it? I don't know, I'm not sure. Because there are definitely plenty of people out there who are actually not able to act in those entanglements. Uh, let me, I just, I'll give you a personal example. When I go to a, a, an update on my computer and it updates the interface of my, some program I use all the time and I get onto it and I cannot find my new way around it and I am cursing, I am thinking, why are they doing this? I don't need this. I have to spend a lot of time trying to understand what they've done now. It worked for me before. That's because I'm old. I'm not up to date. So I actually have to put in a lot of energy to follow what's going on. Why is that happening? Well, to my mind, that's happening because someone new has arrived and thought, I can do this better, differently. I can change it. Did it need to be done? I'm not sure. I'm not certain. So there's something about the constant updating of stuff, changing of stuff. What is that? Why are we doing that? So I'm going to come back and think about that. I had a call from a friend in Guadeloupe this week. She said, I'm in, I need to sign on to all of these agencies in order to get my health care. She has a computer. She's very smart. She has a computer. She has no money. She has no access to the internet. She's not very literate. She's a very good thinker. She goes to the offices in Guadeloupe to say, OK, I need to sign out. I need to fill out these forms. They tell her, go home and fill them out online. She goes home. She can't get online. She hasn't got access. She can't open the computer. That is another really graphic example of how what's happening is it's leaving people out, it's leaving people behind. It's not thinking about all the different angles that things are happening. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is privacy-enhancing technologies and this idea of uh, the capabilities approach. I'm going to let Partha talk for himself. I'm going to have to stop it at some stage, and I, it may be clumsy, so forgive me if it is. Um, Privacy-enhancing technologies. He's talking about how do we keep ourselves safe online and what are the basic things. So I'll let you listen to what he has to say, and we'll have a chance to unpick it a little more afterwards. Hello, uh, I am Partho. I work at the Bristol Cybersecurity Group. My primary research interest is software security. And apart from software security, I also uh, am also interested in making systems inclusive and, and including more people in a digital first society. I come with the belief that the internet is a public good and everybody uh, should be able to participate uh, securely and uh, in the online community and to that end uh, last year in 2022 I led 
the organizing of a workshop at Bristol, which involved key academics in in Bristol, key academics from Cambridge, uh, Lancaster, and some other UK universities. We also had a representative from the National Cybersecurity Center. So that uh, we met over a period of two days and the outcome of that workshop uh, is a manifesto which was uh, signed by everybody uh, who was present uh, at the workshop. So I am going to discuss what we came out with in the manifesto and uh, what we are proposing in, in, in provisioning systems or in how systems are developed. But before that, a quick motivation of why we are doing what we are doing now. <clears throat> so I'll highlight two recent cases in the UK. One was uh, Frances Thomas's uh, unfortunate death. <clears throat> she, was, uh, she was a student and she was under care and she needed help. She had other learning difficulties, etc. So she was supplied with the iPad uh, by her school. Uh, however, that iPad failed to block content which was not appropriate for her. She was exposed to inappropriate content and eventually she took her life. Now that could have been prevented uh, if systems were aware of uh, the deprivations or the needs of, of Francis Thomas. There was another case in England uh, which said that, you know, uh, the judge said that uh, it's not expected that a disabled person will understand everything about uh, privacy controls that are available on, in social media, but they should be able to use it by themselves or with some help. Now, if we go back to notable philosophers in, in, in the domain of uh, who looked, who thought about public provisioning or public goods, they always advocated that the, you know, <clears throat> Uh, you know, public spaces should be made accessible or should be redesigned to facilitate people who are less able, people who are who who have different or specific needs. So we are coming from from that understanding or that belief that 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 the same should apply in case of internet as well. So the idea is that every individual is not equally disposed to engage with digital technologies as we saw in the case of in the two court cases I cited but we are aware of plenty of um, scenarios around us with elderly people with people who are less educated people who are refugees fleeing conflict conflict zones etc so they are not in a position to engage with digital technologies as somebody else in a in a better situation is so consequently what is happening is we are creating a two-tier system where somebody are where some people are rich in protection mechanisms, some people are poor in protection mechanisms. So why, why is this happening? So after say 20 or 30 years since the, since the advent of the uh, discipline called human centered computing, where, you know, they they wanted to bring individuals into the core of system design. Well, one of the things we thought is happening or the reason one of the reasons we thought is that we build systems we take those systems to people and we some sort of do a preference ordering we say okay you know if you like this interface or if you like the other interface and there what now that is very important i'm not saying that they have not made significant contributions they have made significant contributions to systems design Nevertheless, that is more an assessment of how an individual who is a user who can use systems, who is perhaps better disposed than many. When I say many, say, for example, people who are fleeing conflict zones, people who are disabled, people with poor eyesight, people with, you know, slow hands. <clears throat> so they are perhaps in a better position to interact with the system and it's some kind of a preference ordering of what they want, what specified user groups like or enjoy doing. Now, the word util, so this is more a utilitarian way of evaluating systems. Now, as we know from, you know, from other disciplines that the word utility is not meant to capture human needs. 
it is not meant to capture the circumstances in which people are they are merely evaluating people at the surface at the interface of systems so what is the alternative we are proposing so we are proposing that system designers or policy makers who 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 advocate a digital first society they should rather ask the question that what opportunities do people have to use and adopt protection mechanisms so the question of opportunities will capture things like somebody who is elderly things like age influenced deprivations things like conflict people fleeing conflict zones people who are refugees asylum seekers children children with special needs so these deprivations kind of define or limit the opportunities people in those situations have to make use of protection mechanisms so this is what we are proposing that moving from a utilitarian way of assessing things to a more to a better or nuanced understanding of opportunities that individuals have to participate in a digital first society or make use of technology so what is a methodology now there are other disciplines which which are engaged in understanding or uh, in understanding exclusion in provisioning of public goods like food health care etc so there we are saying there is a noted approach called capability approach that was uh, designed by amartya sen he is a uh, nobel laureate economist who was at cambridge when he came up with this uh, approach now he is at harvard so uh, we we thought why not see if capability approach can be applied in designing protection mechanisms particularly in human centered computing capability approach is a framework of thought it there is no as the capability approach that this is one capability approach use it capability approach is a framework of thought it's very half baked it's not fully baked yet so it's more on it also allows for human intuition so the idea is that you know to assess using this approach there are two key components of this approach one is functioning one is capabilities functioning means i say somebody wants to go from point a to b so that is functioning that i human beings want to travel want to go out that is functioning capability denotes the conversion factor so what opportunities people have to achieve that functioning for example if you are to provision transport for somebody who wants to achieve the functioning of traveling from point a to point b would you provision a cycle to somebody who doesn't have legs no because that assessment is based on the needs of that individual so i'm cutting path short because he goes on he explains all the different points in his manifesto but um we can happily share the rest of the talk so you can hear it in his own words but i'm just going to summarize what he goes on to say now which is he has five key ideas in the manifesto and then i'm going to show how as we go on in fact they're very similar worded differently from a different perspective to other thinkers um that are out there so it's from a matthias sen framework of thought and the he's really asking for a more nuanced constant specific assessment of people's situations so a one he's really challenging and we'll see this again later the one size fits all idea okay now the thing about that is to create protection mechanisms that can be used by everybody and by protection mechanisms he's talking about passwording he's talking about dual factor he's talking about dual um you know those boxes where you have to pick all the bicycles and i always get it wrong because i've missed out one of the hub somewhere you know so he's talking about using those sorts of things and i asked him what are the basic protections and he said well that's the very issue people haven't really explored that So to develop a basket of minimum online protections it means working with those people directly who are affected by that and in order to encourage the use because of a sense of empowerment. So 
he also was calling for an assessment of what he calls the winners and the losers. So who actually, as you're developing something, are you thinking about who is actually going to be able to use this, actively thinking about it, and who's going to be left out because of it? And he thinks, and they as a group are saying, you know, it's not actually, enough time is not given to that early enough in the process. And he's challenging the idea of best practice because he is talking about best practice being from the position of people who have a very particular concept of the world. Very often, for them, they suggest that it comes from a single self-referential standpoint. So particular lived experience gives the idea of best practice because best practice often leaves people out. So that's the capabilities approach. And if you want more information on that, or indeed to get in touch with Partha directly, which I know he would like, there's the connections for those at the bottom there. Um, but when I was thinking about this talk and looking at what is out there, I also came across this, techforjustice.org. And they have this project called the Invisibles Project, working with refugees in order to give them digital identities and so that they can become more seen. I was talking to a colleague about this uh, this week, and she said, you know, that's so interesting, because she'd been reflecting on how one of the, one of the outcomes of the digital space is that it's much easier to be invisible in the virtual world than it is in the real world. And that's an interesting concept, isn't it? Of course, because we can't be invisible in the real world. And I thought, okay, that's very interesting. So this is another example of thinking about who is developing the technology and how is it used, who can access it. So these are key questions to hold at the heart of all development, all data use, as you're going through a process. So it's about challenging the systemic inequalities. And there are many people, in fact, people here today and other, many other people who would say those are already embedded in tech. So how can we challenge them? I think earlier it was, you know, it was pointed out we can never get rid, Joanne pointed out, we can never get rid of bias. Of course we cannot, but we can become a hell of a lot more aware of it. So this is one person who's writing about this quite a lot, a woman called Meredith Broussard, she's an American journalist. Um, and she is challenging what is, she calls techno-chauvinism. So it is this idea, an underlying belief in the objective authority of numbers in order to motivate action, assess success, drive growth. So essentially, this is going wandering into the territory of qualitative versus quantitative. So what does the quantity of numbers bring us, but what is it worth without the qualitative moderation of that or bringing it to life? Very important, I think. And for her, she's writing about how, you know, this belief that tech has all the answers based on it being objective because there are a lot of numbers are leading to lots and lots of blind spots. And that the rush, and it is a rush to develop new tech, is leading to lots of shortcuts, which is one of the reasons that we're not doing this level of thinking and engagement. So she's got a lot of challenges, and it's an interesting book. And this is what she says. Building non-sexist, anti-racist technology requires a different mindset and wrestling with complex social issues while also solving thorny technical challenges. Now, just unpicking that, a different mindset, that means becoming aware of your own mindset in order to move to a different one. That is a personal challenge to each and every one of us. Each and every person that works in and around tech, data science, that is the challenge. So what is your mindset? What are your values? Then you're wrestling with complex social issues that everybody is wrestling with and are incredibly difficult all the time. And then you're adding in thorny technical challenges. So it really is not an easy task and nobody is saying it is. Doesn't mean, going back to the first slide, we shouldn't have it as an aspiration to be thinking and moving towards. So her example, for example, is how race, gender, ability, technology all intersect when you're building machine learning models and how actually the data that you're working with, whether it's new data, whether it's recycled data, have the right questions been asked in the right way at the right time in order to generate the data you need or are you going to lead automatically to some form of bias model? So these, this is just one example that she's given. 
So the design just justice movement is working on the same sorts of things. Um, the Nothing About Us Without Us slogan comes from the disability movement. And what they are saying is we need to redesign think processes, design, rethink design processes, so we centre the people who are normally marginalised. And for many people who are working in this field, they are thinking of design as power. Power structures are built into the design of objects, systems, and then we are forced down certain pathways in order to come out to a given end. So, in order to address the deepest challenges, we have to think about design. And they have 10 principles. You can look them all up yourself, but I'm just going to briefly walk through them because they are interesting. So, there is the idea of using design to get free of exploitative and oppressive systems, and that is about power. Who holds power? Who holds uh, the way to inform and direct society? It puts voices of those who are directly impacted, and there are echoes here of Partha's presentation, at the heart of design. And it prioritizes a design over the impacts it's going to have. Again, that echoes Partha's ideas over the utility or the intentions of a designer. So that is also challenging the market force dynamic, which is huge in new tech and the use of media, etc. So it uses this idea that these processes of consultation and working with people are going to inevitably lead to a shift in ideas as you go along. It's an emergent process. So you can't start with, I'm going to have that by the end and consult on it. You have to be open to change as you go. And therefore, the role of the designer is a facilitator rather than an expert. Rather than, right, I'm showing you what I've done. Do you want this version or that version? Because I know. It's saying, OK, you're the people in the process. You understand what it feels like. How do we build that in? So there is, at the core of this, and it is interesting, these are also very, very similar to principles at the heart of conflict transformation work, which has been going on for a long time, which is rebuilding violent societies. And it's about a bottom-up way of thinking that prioritizes people in the situation as having the answers to a situation rather than the people who think they know, right? So it's, it's political, and it's about engaging all the voices. It requires taking time and it's moving towards sustainable goals so you can read the rest of those you can also follow that up if this is of interest to you and I've given you their thing but tech design justice which is a movement now that's emerging at MIT in the states how to make tech fields more human centered um, and to be more attentive to how technologies exclude or create inequities so it's relevant to all sorts of different sorts of fields. And I, I'm sure you in the room coming at this from all your different perspectives could also give me more ways that it's relevant and I'd be interested. But the design of socio, what they call socio-technical objects is absolutely undermined by unconscious bias. And they give some examples how. So for example, that idea of a norm, if you're assessing some piece of to technology and an outlier, well, whose norm? And what is an outlier? If you go back to um, Broussard's book, More Than a Glitch, her point is a, glit, a bug in technology, in tech terms, a bug is important. You have to sort that out. You have to put time and effort in and sort out a bug. A glitch, something like, oh, whoops, never mind. We'll come back to that a bit later. We'll see if we can cycle around and get to it. But actually, she's talking about how these are more than glitches. These are bugs in systems, and they need to be thought about. And she kind of also unpicks I, this idea, or they unpick this idea of technology affordances. So this idea of an affordance, what a technology allows or enables in terms of things. She says again, or they saying again, these are presumed affordances. Right? They're not available to everybody. That goes back to the same thing that Partha was talking about earlier. So um, Costanza Cook is a uh, very key writer on this, and she wrote a book called Design Justice, which is being very influential if anybody's interested. So the core principles. So if you're not on the table, you're on the menu. If you're not at the table, you're on your menu. I like that, right? I think that's important, and that is the truth of it, because all of this stuff is being driven with a money market mind, 
okay? And it's about generating money for some people somewhere. I watched The Social Dilemma again the other day. I'm sure you've all seen it. But that is one of the core messages of that film as well. That film was made five years ago. Not a lot of progress has been made. And I was at a conference in February in San Francisco with Silicon Valley and Peace Builders and Tristan Harris, who's in that film, was one of the core drivers of that conference. And they're trying to look at the same thing, why the polarization is still going on. So you have to bring the people who are affected into the process. You have to really open up your mind and get rid of your expert idea and recognize that everyone has a piece of the puzzle. Okay, it may not be your piece, but from their own lived experience, everyone has a piece of the puzzle to share. And it's only people with a specific lived experience that will have insight. We may think we know, we may think we understand, but actually, no. So we have to think about that when we're thinking about how we're dismantling some of what is termed here oppressive, and we understand why, I'm sure, structures surrounding this. So, Experience is an insight central to design. So the, what they're drawing on is participatory action research, which obviously Ernesto was also talking about earlier, and the Scandinavian tradition of co-design, co-creation, so working in partnership. And also intersectional thinking, writing, um, engagement. So really understanding that it's about situated knowledge in a particular position, in a particular place, with all of these different frames meeting in their own way for each individual. So it's not an easy task. I mean, nobody says it's an easy task, but it's about having this understanding. So this is the top tech justice design questions. How social relations are reproduced by design? How do we move to a more community control of design processes? And in terms of tech, they, they ask these questions. Who gets to do the design? What stories do we tell about design? Um, who do we design for or with, market forces? What values are we bringing to that process? That is a very important one. You know, it's often skipped over. It's not easy to get people to reflect deeply about who they are and what they're doing and what they want to contribute. So how do we frame design problems, but also who owns them, who benefits, who makes them money? So in all in all, it's this. Times are urgent let us slow down because design justice does implore, imply taking more time to produce something and one of the things in san francisco when we were talking about toxic polarization that was really identified was the rush the rush the rush in the startup tech culture is a really big problem and that actually a lot of the ways to design tech that is more accessible to everybody, it costs money and who's gonna make money out of it? So is it gonna happen? So there's a whole thing there about challenging the market forces that surround it and the way we talk about it. So more humility, less hubris. So I don't quite know what the time is, how much time I have. I did think we could stop Got 10 minutes. Okay, well, let's not talk. Let's me whiz through last few and then maybe we could have a couple of questions. So, so Peace Tech is rebuilding societies, but it's also about maintaining social ties, social glue, cohesion. So, of course, that's what we're seeing in the destruction, the interruption of the political processes, the polarization online. And John Paul Ledrack, big thinker and activist and practitioner in the field, he says, requires moral imagination. How do we imagine something rooted in the challenges of the real world, but giving birth to something that does not yet exist? So I think maybe that's what we're engaged with right here and right now. So there's something interesting. So he's challenging us to turn on our imaginations. And Peace Tech is the intersection, as I've said, about both. So in California, we were talking about this. What significant attention is on digital harms but it's not really on how you create social cohesion, and she defines there how to do that. So that is a really interesting thing for us to think about, all of us. And I was approached by a company who've been doing digital peace building for a long time, very recently, saying they've been working in the States and other countries, and they're interested in doing a project like that in the UK because they think that those that toxic polarization as we've seen with the republican and democrats is going to be here very soon 
So there's something about getting ahead of the curve and thinking about that. So low tech is leveraging everyday tools. It's rather than all this newness, new models, new platforms, new software, Actually, if you want things to be really, truly accessible to people, you have to use the tools they can A, use, and B, they can lay their hands on. So for many people all around the world, that isn't people who are good at tech and can manage the latest thing. It's actually what is there. And the Peace Tech Lab, it's based in America, um, they say putting the right tools in the right hands at the right time. They've been running a series of projects which they call the Road to Equal Justice, which is about bringing together local tech firms, social activists, and um, media specialists. So again, Ernesto, this reminded me of your work a bit, in order to allow people to generate data from their own perspective in order to challenge what they see as kind of politically informed sometimes inequities. And that allows people to develop all these new skills as well. So could we use that in the UK? Yes, we most definitely could. So for example, there's a really good potential to use that in order to challenge very faulty stop and search procedures in the UK. And the point is that the data on that is very thin and it's collected by the authorities. And it's one thing. Whereas, if you ran a project where you got people together, you trained them how to collect much more nuanced data, so it's not just how many times they've been stopped and searched, but it's, you know, how much education did they get, or, you know, how many jobs have they tried to go for, what's the housing situation, you know, you kind of get a much fuller picture of people's lives. You allow them to design that. You work with data specialists in order to work out how to create that and then you work with media specialists in order to turn that into really usable ways of changing hearts and minds at policy making level. So yes, I think so definitely. I'm fully on board and started thinking about how we might be able to do this. So that's really all I have and that's what I'm trying to say. Um, less is more I think is a very good slogan. Go slower, stop trying to do new stuff, try to work out how to use what we have better and improve it. Outside the data science and the tech world, that's how it looks. Thank you. Yeah. Do you, want to, do you want to have a bit of response questions? Or what would you like? I was thinking that yeah. we could, I'm sure there would be some questions in the room, and then we've got, we've got five minutes, I think, to do that. So I wonder if we could open it up a bit. Yeah, Ernesto. Yeah, I just wanted to challenge this idea of the representation in the table. You right? want to challenge, in, challenge? The, the idea of the, this comes from a liberal tradition that is um, very global north. They, there's this romantic idea of the parliament, and one, once you engage in these thorny kind of like conflict reading spaces. For instance, one of the mothers didn't want to include transsexual people in the design. Yeah, yeah. And she has a, a, an experience, right? She's a mother of disappeared. But then either I accept that as a judgment that should just go like non-sanctioned non or I should challenge her. I decided to challenge her and the other uh, people in the room that were, I mean, I didn't think that had anything to do with the decision, but they had all these very conservative ideals of how this technology should be used and who had to speak in the table. So one of the things that I find a little bit um, difficult with this more global north romantic idea of representation is that these thorny issues of people trying to exclude others once they are in... So where did you find the Global North idea of representation in there? In this idea that everyone should sit at the table, right? Like, this, th there's well, this romantic idea of the table as a space in which we find emancipation. But suddenly yeah. we find ourselves with other people that are bigoted and might... Uh, want... Very much so, and I, I've, had that ex oh, I've had that experience in practice very often when I'm actually working on the ground. You're training people, for example, to be community facilitators in a huge block of flats. They're fantastic people at some level. They're very bigoted at other levels, as most of us are in some way. So there is no perfect way of doing it, I agree. Uh, interestingly, a lot of that work, uh, John Paul Ledrack's work, was based in South America. And it was based on local um, situated work in South America when he had a lot of his Global North ideas challenge. So you're right. There's always something to unpick in there, definitely. It's not possible to get everyone in the room. 
to what extent, like, do you believe that, like, the profit-driven nature of, like, a lot of these platforms inherently means you can never have, like, any kind of equitable space? And only if it's no longer... Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm just... That, that question. <laughs> I mean, I am, I am not an expert on that, so, and I don't want to even talk about that as if I was, right? But there are a lot of people... When I was in the conference in San Francisco with other members of the group, that was what was being discussed, and the big, big platforms were at that conference, and they were discussing that. And what was actually being discussed a lot was a shift towards pro-social platform design. So how can you actually develop... Uh, collaborative online platforms as opposed to competitive ones. So that is something I don't, I don't have any idea how you can reel back from where you've got to with the platforms you've got, but I can see that there is a potential to build uh, different ways of doing that. One example that was given was bridging systems which pick up on collaborative, cooperative language and use that as an algorithm to feed three people through rather than competitive language. So. Um, I don't know if that answers your question at all, but that's what it brings to mind. Thank you. Thank you very much for that and um, I think it really relates a lot to the work I'm doing around climate action. Um, so there's a big movement for community-led climate action, yep. very much going back to less is more and working on what communities have and what they, so participatory decision making around that. So on the one hand we've got that going on with going to communities, with tech communities can access. And then on the other, we had this morning the idea that it's going faster and faster, we've got to go faster and faster, otherwise we'll lose out on GDP and productivity and lose rankings in the world. Um, how do you, we've got a dichotomy there, how do you, how can we bring that together? I, I, I mean, <laughs> how would I know? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. What I, all I, all I can say is, I can see, we can all see, we're going too fast on many levels in many directions. And maybe that's a challenge for all of us to think about, is how do we slow down? What is it that we can sort of, you know, where can we prick some of the bubbles that can allow things to slow down? I'm not certain what that is, and I'm, I'm really not here saying I have answers. I do not have any answers. I have thinking, I have an opportunity with my colleagues to collaboratively, collaboratively discuss and to see, but I think we're all working on these things in our different ways, I'm sure. So thank you for that. How are we doing? Any other, any other questions? Very, very thought-provoking. Well, I found it, yeah, enormously challenging and also exciting to think about other, other kinds of futures for these technologies and for our part in them. So thank you very much, Hen. Let's give a round of applause for Hen. Thank you.